The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. Well, the Middle East starts with the fact that uh, it is mainly a desert. 97% of the space of the Middle East is an arid, dry land, giant very dry, like the Sahara Desert, the Saudi Desert, and the Syrian, the Iraqi, all these are big desert. And in the desert, uh, not only today, for time immemorial, people have to survive. In order to survive, they have to stick to a source of water, a spring, a well, a ditch, whatever. And there are other people who want the water as well. So life in the desert is a constant fight for survival, for the water. Uh, this is why you have to live in big frameworks in order to defend yourself, because a smaller framework is weaker. And the most consolidated uh, group is the family, the brothers. After a, generations, after a generation, it is the cousins. Then second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, and here we have a tribe. And tribal, tribalism, actually, is the cornerstone of the societies of the Middle East. And tribal behavior is totally different than behavior of individuals as societies are in the West in modern times. And unfortunately, the societies of the Middle East remain tribal to a large extent. This is the situation in, in Libya, in Algeria, in Yemen, in Jordan, in, Lib in, in Syria, in Iraq. Uh, uh, millions of millions of people live in frameworks which we, as Westerners, find very hard to understand. Because according to the tribal mindset, the other, means the other tribe, is the enemy. Whoever he is, he could be the state, he could be another tribe, he could be another nation, like Kurds, it could be anyone. So this is why violence, and because of the fight over the water, is so deeply embedded into the culture of the Middle East, way before Islam came to the world. Already uh, when tribes were here, pagan uh, uh, tribes before Islam came, uh, like 1500 years ago almost. So uh, this is the, the, the origin of violence in the Middle East. With the time, there are other things which were added a religion or different religions. Look, in the Middle East there are ten religions, more or less. Muslims, Christians, Jews, Yazidis, um, uh, Alawis, Druze, Sabais, Mandais, Zoroastrians, uh, uh, almost every religion in this, in this region is viewed by Muslims, radical Muslims, as, um, uh, as idol worshipping. People who do not have, even have the right to live if they stick to their religions and they have to be forced to Islam. So another source of violence when it comes to religion. You can add to this the ethnic issues which also are in the, in the Middle East. We have groups like Arabs and Kurds and Turks and, Turk, and, and Turkmen's, Turks which are not Turkmen's and um, uh, uh, Persians, and Azeris, and, sub and, and all kinds of other Berbers in North Africa. And uh, the, the friction between these two these, these groups was usually not nice friction. Uh, and, and the last problem which can be added to all these uh, excess of fragmentation, you can add 
today, or since Islam came to the world, the sectarianism within the Islamic societies, between the Shia and the Sunnah and the Salafis and the Sufis, and so many sects that are inside the Islamic realm. So uh, these societies of the Middle East are actually fragmented uh, according to four axes of fragmentation, the tribal one, the ethnic one, the religious one, and the sectarian one. And if you add all these uh, 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 problems to the uh, uh, violence, which is anyway embedded to the culture because of the desert, you can understand how violence is unfortunately in too many places the name of the game. When you say that we are in the 21st century and we all look for peace and tranquility and, and, and good life, this is actually thinking like a Western when it comes to the Middle East and tries to understand the Middle East with the mindset of the West, of Americans, of Europeans and others. This is a very big mistake because it is almost impossible to understand a culture with the toolbox of, other, of another culture. There are different cultures in the world. Some think that death is bad, some think that death is a way or path to, uh, to the paradise. So that's what it, it is good. When life in Europe is so nice, they sanctify life. When life is so miserable in the Middle East, they sanctify death. So th this is why you cannot assess and judge one society on one culture with a toolbox and measure, measurement uh, of another uh, culture. It doesn't work. The Gulf Emirates, and I mean Kuwait, Qatar, and the seven Emirates of the Union, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and so forth, they are stable, not because they, uh, they marched into the 21st century. They are stable because, and not, not also because of the oil. Dubai has almost no oil. Iraq, on the other side, has much of oil, and Iraq is a hell. And so is Libya, with much oil it is a hell, and Yemen, and Sudan. What makes good life and prosperity in the Gulf Emirates, and I exclude Bahrain, is the fact that every one of them is guided by one single tribe. I don't count the foreign workers, I don't find the business people who come to these countries, I'm talking about the citizens. In Kuwait it's Al Sabah, it's the name of the tribe which controls the country. In Qatar, it's Al Thani. In uh, Abu Dhabi, it's Al Nihyan. That's the name of the, of, of the tribe. And when most of the citizens belong to one tribe, so nobody tries to shake the boat, the society is consolidated. On this, you can build a stable political arena. And on this, you can build skyscrapers with helicopter pads on them, while Iraq, in spite of the oil, is fragmented according to tribal line, ethnic line, religious line, and sectarian line. Everybody fights everybody else. The political arena cannot function because when tribes fight in the street, the representatives of the tribes in the parliament are fist fighting in the parliament itself. So who will invest in such a country which is torn apart by violence. So it doesn't start with money or oil. It starts with the stability, which is achieved by the fact that the society is homogenous. And this is why the Gulf Emirates are stable, can adopt all kinds of modern devices. It doesn't mean that they are modern. Modern means in Arab societies, modernism means, first of all, if a man lets his daughter marry somebody not from his tribe or ethnic group. I'm not talking about Muslims uh, marry Christians. I'm talking about Muslims marry Muslims, it, as according to the Sharia. Yet, if he gets out of the tribal thinking and allows his daughter to uh, uh, um, get married to somebody whom she loves and she got, she got familiar with him in the university or in the workplace, this is modernism which is so far rather rare in Arab, many Arab societies. 
And I, I don't, uh, uh, I'm not impressed by using of internet. I'm not impressed by using of cell phones or tablets or whatever people use. This is not the sign of modernism. Modernism is if a father allows his daughter get married to somebody whom he did not choose for her from the family or from the clan or from the uh, close environment. Here in Israel, uh, definitely uh, people who came from the West marry with people who came from the East, Arab countries, European countries, especially second generation and third generation here. I myself and my family, <laughs> we, we, we get married, you know, between West and East and, and no Norris because it's not an issue, especially when it comes to modern Orthodox and uh, 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 secular people in Israel. Okay, we have the ultra-Orthodox sectors which still try to, to preserve the, the, the so-called tribal and so no tribes, but the sectarianism. Yes, or, or the Arabs in Israel, yeah, definitely. But when you come to the majority of the Jewish population here in Israel, definitely, as long as uh, people get married with Jews, I, I think that within modern uh, 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 sectors of the society, uh, we don't see anymore this uh, tribalism which our grandfathers, grandmothers came from, from Poland or from Morocco. Well, Bashar Assad, when he came to power in the year of 2000, everybody was hoping that he will bring Syria to modern times. At the beginning, actually, between August 2000 and the end of the year, November, December, he actually allowed uh, um, um, clubs to be open. Clubs with open discussion about politics, about culture. And he actually loosened the grip which was holding the society, the society in Syria for 30 years under his father between 1970 and 2000. Everybody hoped this man is a doctor and he serves in the internet and his mother, he speaks English very nicely, unlike his father, and he spent some years in Britain. So everybody was praising him for uh, the future in which he will bring in modern times. Don't, don't forget, he's Alawi and he's married to a Muslim a, a woman, which also uh, shows some kind of getting out of the uh, of the uh, frameworks in marriage, as I mentioned, as a kind of modernism. Definitely, everybody had these hopes. But uh, later, in 2001, first of all, it closed all the, these clubs which were established a few months earlier, and uh, again, uh, uh, um, uh, made the grip fastened on the neck, uh, necks of the people. Then, later, when uh, in, in, in uh, 2011, when the uh, rebellion of the Arab, what was called the Arab Spring, uh, started to uh, come to Syria in March of 2011, very, uh, very uh, fast, the, his regime started to shoot into demonstrations. And the situation today definitely is much worse than, than what it was in his father's days. Because his father was known to be bloodthirsty because he killed uh, um, more or less 50,000 people in six years of rebellion of uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood between 1976 and 1982 with the culmination of this uh, oppression in Hamad, uh, or the massacre of some 20,000 people in, uh, in, in Hamad in February uh, 1982. Uh, so people thought that 50,000 people is, wow, a tremendous number of his father when he killed bloodthirsty. Today, Bashar, uh, in, in his days, in, in his term, the, num the death toll already in Syria is around 250,000 people, more or less. So he's five times as a bloodthirsty as his father. Okay, so where is the modernism? Where is the internet? Where is the doctorate? Where is his, his education as an eye doctor? Where is his uh, tablet? And the Muslim wife, he kills Muslims today with, with no restriction, with barrels which he drops from helicopters. So, uh, yes, there were hopes in, 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 in Syria when Bashar came, but those hopes were shattered to pieces on the ground 
of the problems which erupted in Syria because of differences between Alawis who are viewed as infidels by Muslims and the Druze and the Christians and the Kurds when he talked about ethnicity and the Arabs and all the factions in, uh, in, in Syria which never became a nation. The same thing with Iraq, there was never an Iraqi nation. People remained loyal to the traditional frameworks, to the tribe, the ethnic, the religious and the sectarian groups and they never replaced their loyalty from being loyal to the traditional framework to the modern state. The modern state failed in settling in the hearts of the people. The same thing in Libya, in Algeria, in Yemen, in Sudan. And you know what? I'm not so sure that the Palestinian a, a nation or idea also replaced the tribalism which is very deeply embedded into the what we call Palestinians. Gazans are looked upon by people from the West Bank from high and above because they speak in different dialect of Arabic because their mindset is different and not only this even within Judea and Samaria people in Hebron the Khalayla as they call them are viewed totally differently and the people than the people from Nablus or Ramallah. Okay stereotypes and we and them still play a major role inside the society, but people do not know about this. People aren't aware of this. And they think that there is a Palestinian people, just like as there is a Syrian people, or Iraqi, or Libyan, or Sudani people. All these are virtual uh, 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 creations of the West, made by the West, mainly for the West. And uh, some people who do not look into the real things in the Arab world, people are not exposed to the sociology of the Arab world, people are not exposed to the languages of the Arab world. How many uh, politicians in the West speak Arabic to understand what Arabs say, not to them, but within themselves? Okay, so for this you need the researcher who knows the language and the mindset of this region in order to understand what turns this region apart. Look, we have to look at the history of what we call Palestinians. First of all, in January 2006, Hamas won the elections, democratic elections, the first elections in the Palestinian Authority. And uh, until this very day, Hamas have the majority of the seats of the Palestinian Legislative Council. Who in the world can prevent it from happening again? Nobody. So we have to assume that this will, at least uh, it, there is a possibility that it will happen again. Secondly, we have to remember what happened exactly eight years ago in June uh, 2007 when Hamas took Gaza over by force, killing some 200 of their brothers. We have to assume that this can happen again. If it happened already, who will prevent it from happening again? The White House, uh, the, the French uh, uh, president or the British queen? Who will come here to prevent it? So we as Israelis have to take in account that there is a good possibility that these scenarios will repeat themselves in the West Bank as well. Means one evening we'll go to sleep with a peace agreement with the PLO to wake up in the next morning to find that Hamas took over during the night and killed or threw from the high roofs the security people of the PA or the Palestinian state this time uh, uh, from uh, you know and took over the in Gaza uh, uh, the West Bank totally and instead of having them dug in the sand in tunnels in like in Gaza we'll find them dug in the rocks of the mountains under Jerusalem and uh, under uh, uh, Kfar Saba which is adjacent to the border so Definitely a, a, a Palestinian state on the West Bank means, in my view, at least a possibility of another Hamastan which will pose a danger on 80% of the Jewish population of Israel with the short-range missiles, all the way from Dimona and Be'er Sheva in the south, through the whole coastal area, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Ben Gurion Airport, and uh, uh, Hadera uh, uh, with a big uh, 
uh, uh, power station and Afula and, 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 and Beit Sha'an. All this with the short range missiles. The longer range missiles will reach to Haifa Harbor, to Nahariya, and to other places of Israel. And this is a strategic threat on the existence of the state of Israel. So all those uh, uh, good hearted people uh, in France and some of them in the United States as well, who do not see beyond today. Uh, we here, here in the Middle East understand the nature of this, uh, of this region much better than others. And we are here as, I would say, the first bastion of Western civilization in the Middle East. If Israel is forced to establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank, which will pose it a strategic threat on Israel, uh, Israel is in a danger. And if Israel collapses because of this, the waves will not stop here. The waves will go to Cyprus and to Greece and into Europe. And the Atlantic Ocean is not wide enough to keep America from the ways of Islamism, which will be encouraged by the collapse of the state of Israel. Uh, which was sacrificed by the West, mainly by France, by some people in the United States of America, to give a Palestinian state which brought the end of the state of Israel. This will encourage them tremendously and they will run to harvest the, uh, this achievement in Europe, in America and wherever they can achieve. The Islamic State it's not ISIS anymore because they omitted the second IS, Iraq and Syria. Today, their aspirations since like, last year, since last June, uh, when they had a became a caliphate, today they actually see themselves as the masters of all the Muslims from Indonesia in the east all the way to California in the west, in the long way. Um, they claim that they are actually the real Islam the original Islam. And their behavior of beheading, burning people, amputating people's hands and feet, uh, shooting uh, women in the street, selling Yazidi girls uh, to slavery, all these things are actually uh, the way how Muhammad, peace be upon him, the prophet of Islam, and his companions, how they behaved means the Islamic State, in its view, is actually a resurrection of the real Islam, the original Islam, before it was corrupted by all kinds of messages which came from the West and from modernism, all these things which should be abolished. Unfortunately, this appeals to too many Muslims all over the world. And you see today the influx of volunteers from Europe, from America, even from Israel. We have some dozens of people who went to Turkey in order to go to the Islamic State. In Sinai, organizations already pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. In Gaza, in Boko Haram, in Nigeria, in, 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 inside the heartland of Africa, already pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. We see the representation in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in the Balkans. Also, we see them also in, uh, in, 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 in some areas in the southern part of, uh, of Russia, the Caucasus. So this idea of the Islamic State within a year more or less, since they came to the stage of the Middle East, became the next thing in the, Middle East, in the whole world of the Islamic world. So many people from the Philippines, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from India uh, came to the Islamic State to take part in the jihad against the infidels. Now, some of them go back to, to the countries, to Europe, to other countries. So what do you think? They will become lawyers and accountants and media people? No, they will continue the jihad, at least some of them will continue the, the jihad in any way possible, which is in those countries. But since those countries let them because of their democratic states, uh, they let them do whatever they like. So unless they kill people, uh, they, they, they can uh, uh, um, uh, address people and to convince them to go to, to, to the Islamic State, to the Iraq and Syria, 
and to get trained and then come back and to export the, the jihad. And definitely they are doing it, in my mind, at least partially, with the waves of immigrants to Europe. I'm not sure that all those poor people, poor people who look for life, look for normal life in Europe, who cross the Mediterranean and other ways come to Europe in order to open new page in their life, normal life, some of them, I'm almost sure, are implanted by radical organizations. They make faces as if they are, they are poor people who come in order to have some food and shelter and uh, good health. But as sleeping cells, uh, one day they will wake up and they might turn the life in Europe to hell. I'm not sure that this doesn't uh, occur already these days. So we have to take it in, in account. Uh, Israeli society is on, when it comes to security, that we have no differences between right and left, between religious and non-religious, between, even between Jews and Arabs. Look, Arabs do not want to destroy the country, in, in general. Uh, Arabs, even in Israel, although they don't love the country, although the country doesn't represent their culture because we are, you know, the flag and the national anthem and the language and the holidays and all these things are more or less Jewish, yet many of them, I would say most of them, the majority of them, prefer to live in such a state as a minority rather than living in the majority in places like Syria, Iraq, even Jordan, when the Palestinians are oppressed by the kingdom and by the Bedouins who are a minority. And not to mention Libya and Algeria and all this, and even Egypt is, is, is not a, 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 a heaven on earth yet. So definitely the Arabs in Israel join the Jews they, don't, they wouldn't say that, they wouldn't admit it, but many of them would preserve the state of Israel as it is uh, in order to have nicer life than any other alternative in the Palestinian Authority. Arabs refuse in Israel, refuse to be included in the Palestinian future state, refuse systematically through the time because they know exactly what it is to live in an Arab state. Which, you know, you know what happens today, you know what will happen uh, tomorrow. Maybe Hamas will come, maybe other organizations, much more unpredictable than it is in Israel with all the changes which we have uh, in Israel. So, uh, so definitely within Israel, we have a good, uh, let's say, very healthy majority of the population in Israel, both Jews and Arabs, who would preserve Israel, fight for it, uh, and uh, keep it as it is. We have, let's say, peace with Egypt, not based on love, hugs and kisses, but on shared uh, interests. Uh, we have peace with Jordan, with the Jordanian kingdom, I would say, because a majority of the Jordanians, the Palestinians, do not like this peace, to say the least. So, but as long as the kingdom is a kingdom of uh, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, we still have the peace agreement with them. We have to be alert about what happens in, in, in Jordan, especially because of the threats of the Islamic State, which come from the Northeast. Uh, Syria once was a state which posed dangers on Israel, strategic dangers. Uh, Syria does not exist anymore as a state. Syria became a battlefield of who knows how many hundreds of militias, of uh, religions, of sects, and uh, people who kill each other with or without reason. So Syria as a state is no threat anymore. We have now a threat, a, a tactical threat from jihadists, whether it's the Islamic State or the Nusra or the others, uh, which definitely are not causing uh, uh, you know, uh, peace in this region, but uh, as a state, they do not function yet. They don't have weapons of mass destruction as the Syrian state had. And don't forget that when Syria actually dissolves, uh, the Iranian pact of this region, which includes Iran, Iraq, Syria formerly, 
and Hezbollah in Lebanon, this pact is weakened when the Syrian state dissolves. Now we have to, to deal with uh, some problems with, with the Hezbollah. There is a possibility that Hezbollah, instead of using its stockpile of missiles against us, will start using them against the rebels in Syria. Means that the uh, uh, division of power in the Middle East actually works for Israel because Arabs and Muslims actually fight within themselves. Sunnah versus Shia, ISIS versus Nusra, uh, ISIS versus uh, other countries. So the fragmentation of the Arab and the Islamic world around Israel actually makes Israel a much safer place than it is viewed from the outside. As long as we know how to part ourselves from the problems of the Middle East in order not to be sunk, sucked into this swamp of blood, tears and fire as the Arab world is today. Well, there are two major developments uh, on the ground in Syria. Uh, the first, the important one, is of course the change of the tendency. I mean, for some time when the war started, we were sure that uh, Assad days were number. Then we came to the conclusion that he might survive uh, for a long time. Now, if we look back at what happened in Syria during the last year, a uh, clear uh, process of deterioration, uh, he's losing ground, I mean, he's bleeding, and there is a clear doubt whether he can survive uh, for another year or two. I mean, it can take some, t some more time, but, but clearly he's in a, a terrible position. This is on the one hand. The other thing is, of course, that uh, the rebels uh, are gaining momentum, and this, you know, their victories um, bring them closer to Israel. ISIS is now one hour drive from the Israeli-Syrian border and the entire Golan Heights is under the control of uh, rebels. Some of them are affiliated with Jabhat al-Nusra, more pragmatic and still an organization which is affiliated to uh, Al-Qaeda. Well, when it all began, we were speaking about 1,000, maybe less, uh, armed gangs all around Syria rebel groups, but actually these were uh, groups emerged in each town and village. Uh, they were fighting among themselves, each other, and also against the uh, regime. No uh, unity, no uh, leader, clear military or political leadership. This has changed during the last year, let's say. I mean, uh, in a very slow process, I mean, some of the bigger uh, groups and related, the, the, the smaller one, uh, some small groups join forces with the bigger uh, groups. So nowadays we are speaking mainly about ISIS in the eastern part of Syria. The western part, uh, part is mainly under the control of Jabhat al Nusra. Uh, and, uh, still some more pragmatic, uh, moderate groups, some of them with Islamic colors, uh, belong or under the influence of the Saudis, the Qataris, and some, some are, uh, still belong to the Free Syrian Army, but that's basically the picture. The, the two important major groups are ISIS in the east and Jabhat al-Nusra in the uh, west. Nobody likes uh, ISIS. ISIS is not ready to cooperate with no one and they are fighting each other in any place you can find them together. Uh, still, the process is that uh, once ISIS is getting to a certain village or town, I mean Jabhat al-Nusra as an organization is fighting ISIS, is opposing ISIS, but if ISIS is winning, the supporters, those who belong to Jabhat al-Nusra, simply defect and join ISIS. This is the process. So on the organizational level, of course, we are speaking about two opposing groups and they are fighting each other and are not ready to accept the existence of each other. At the same time, on the ground, I mean, what is happening on the ground is that you can see supporters moving from one group to the other. Well, ISIS uh, 
is fighting anyone in the Middle East, but clearly, I mean, Washington blame uh, the Assad regime for supporting. I don't think that the Assad regime does support. Of course, it benefits from the existence of ISIS, because if you compare Assad to ISIS, Assad looks to us as an angel. And, and uh, still, of course, uh, ISIS, I, I wouldn't say um, somebody is providing him with support, but uh, the, the Turkish border is open. So volunteers, it's not that Turkey support directly ISIS, but allow people to uh, cross the border. Uh, he uh, sells oil. He produces oil in the eastern part of Syria. He sells them to, to the Syrian regime, to the Turks. I mean, so, so nobody is supporting him in a direct way, but he benefits from the connection he has with, with uh, uh, elements, uh, countries in the region. Uh, rebels on the western side of Syria are clearly supported by the Turks, by the Jordanians, by the Saudis, by the Qataris, also by the United States. On the ground, we can still see uh, direct Russian support, but of course the Russians are not crazy, are not ready to send troops and are not ready, I mean, to support a lost case. But they still believe that ba uh, Bashar al-Assad can survive in Damascus or in the coast, and they still uh, give him an umbrella, diplomatic umbrella, prevent any decision from being taken in the uh, Security Council of the UN, and of course still provide him with money and ammunition. The main support comes from Iran and mainly from Hezbollah. I mean, thousands of warriors from Hezbollah join forces with the Assad uh, army inside Syria and are fighting the rebels all around Syria. He needs a miracle. I mean, he needs a change in government and in, uh, in government in Turkey. He needs uh, an intervention on on his behalf, uh, American intervention on his behalf. It wouldn't help uh, happen. I mean, he needs a miracle and I can't see any miracle uh, soon. Mm. Uh, he's now in Damascus. He will move to the Alawite coast. I mean, populated mainly by his own community, the Alawites, but it will be very difficult for him to uh, secure his position there because the rebels will continue to attack him. He will probably go uh, to Iran or to, to Moscow, the only places in the world uh, which will be ready to accept him. First of all, you know, no more Christians are to be left in Iraq or Syria. This will be the major uh, uh, change. Syria and Iraq with no Christians. I mean, Christians used to live in, in, in Syria for one, 2,000 years, and they were 10% out of the total population. Um, now maybe less than 5% and they are leaving. With the Druze and the Alawites, it will be more difficult. I mean. Uh, I mean, isolated communities in a certain region, they are a majority in a certain region. Uh, these regions can easily be uh, defended. Uh, so, so it's going to be more difficult for the rebels, for ISIS to uh, get into these areas. But of course, the, the um, promise of ISIS is very clear. No uh, such communities will be allowed to exist in Syria. ISIS is posing an existential threat for the minorities. With the other rebels, you know, uh, massacres, but not, uh, uh, not, as I said before, an existential threat to the existence of communities in, in this region, because after all, they are all Syrians, they will take revenge of each other, but eventually they know they need to find a way to uh, live in coexistence. The Syrian and the Iraqi armies are too weak. And the only solution is to send ground forces, but nobody is ready to send ground forces. I mean, uh, even the Jordanian, the Saudis, I mean, to send ground forces to fight ISIS and to help in, in indirect way, Iran and Syria, this is craziness. The only one who can do it uh, is President Obama. But uh, the last thing he needs is another Iraq, another Afghanistan, another intervention, uh, which might not lead to any solution. The Libyan situation, I mean, Syria will turn to be Libya or Yemen, chaos, you know, people are fighting each other and everybody, now they blame ISIS. Uh, in the future they might blame Obama, so no solution. We have to remember that Druze in Syria are loyal to the Syrian state, exactly as Druze in Israel are loyal to the Israeli state. And no one of them is asking, is begging for an Israeli support. Druze in Israel think that we should support their 
families, uh, the brothers in Syria. But I think that, yes, in an indirect way, it is in the interest of Israel to try and help them to confront ISIS. But uh, direct intervention, it's craziness, because direct intervention will lead to uh, the entrance of Israeli forces into this arena. It's craziness. You know where you start, you never know where you'll, you'll find yourself at the end. Hezbollah is one minute or on the border. I mean, uh, should the solution be an Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the occupation of Lebanon? We know where it starts. You know, you need to find a solution. You need to find a way to protect yourself, to defend and secure your border. You need to collect uh, more uh, accurate intelligence on these groups to target them if they try to uh, target you. But an invasion, an Israeli presence on Syrian soil, it will be a craziness. The price will be much higher than... Uh, and, and people in Israel start speaking about, you know, a very strange alliance, Israel, Iran and Hezbollah against ISIS. We are not that yet, but, but clearly it, it's, it's a problem. And still, what is the alternative? Uh, invade and occupy the entire Lebanon or entire Golan Heights? Uh, I mean, we are facing very difficult and serious dilemma, no doubt about it. And exactly as the United States, exactly as the international community, we have no clear solution to the situation. ISIS was a branch of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And then he split from uh, Al-Qaeda, and now he declared himself as the new Al-Qaeda an upgrade of Al-Qaeda, and of course, he rebelled against Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda has a presence in Syria. Jabhat al-Nusra is loyal to Al-Qaeda, so through Jabhat al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda tries to influence uh, the events on the ground, but uh, of course, for Al-Qaeda, ISIS is, is a threat, is an enemy, and for ISIS, Al-Qaeda and Jabhat al-Nusra are enemies, so they are fighting each other, but eventually they all, or the winner, will fight us. We have to remember it. I think that the Jordania will be very careful not to interfere and uh, invade uh, Syria. Once again, you know, they are not strong enough to invade and occupy another country. They will try, like Israel, to secure their border and to protect their border. Any intervention, it's craziness. You know where you start, you never know where you end. And uh, I mean, there should be an international effort to uh, contain this ISIS threat, the threat posed by ISIS, confront the uh, organization, but, you know, uh, one certain country is not clear, clearly is not we, is strong enough to, to do it uh, by itself. I, I, I mean, what we see is that in certain states like Egypt, nobody speaks anymore about the Arab uh, Spring. In other countries, the Arab Spring, well, was not a spring, but, you know, a challenge to the uh, authoritarian regime. In Egypt, and one authoritarian regime was replaced by another. Sisi replaced Mubarak. In the case of Syria, Libya, Iraq, it led to a chaos and to the disintegration of the state. The state was not strong enough to uh, withstand this earthquake. I mean, chaos, chaos, uh, like in Somalia. No target, no one to speak with. I mean, so the, the, the best thing to do is to contain to the situation to avoid and prevent the spreading of this chaos to other countries like Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Israel, Jordan, and to look after and target those who are trying to carry out attacks against you, but no other solution for the time being. So there are bombing uh, and, and carrying out operation, very limited one, but with no success. I mean, ISIS is still there, you know, it's a, a local phenomenon and uh, you need to deal with him, you know, when you need a strategy, you need the support of the local population, you need to recruit the local population, you need to give them an alternative. This is a very uh, serious and difficult uh, task and that's what you should do because no easy solution. ISIS has support within the local Palestinian population in the West Bank and Gaza and in, among Israeli Arabs. Any village, any, I mean, uh, take 1,000 uh, Muslims around the world, Sunnis of course, some will identify with ISIS. This is uh, the problem. You shouldn't allow so, so, so we need to take it as, as a fact on the ground and you should contain and this threat and this uh, 
challenge and to deal with it. And that's what Israel is doing. That's, by the way, also what the Hamas is doing. They took a strategic decision to reach some sort of a compromise or a ceasefire with Israel, I mean, and to focus on their, uh, their survival inside the Gaza Strip. And that's what they are doing, keeping the border quiet, trying to contain uh, any group that is trying to challenge this ceasefire. And, and trying to cope with a very difficult situation, you know, the Egyptian on the one and the Israelis on the other hand, we, we need to see where it will lead Hamas in the future, but that's for the time being. Because they see ISIS as a threat because ISIS, of course, wants to replace Hamas in Gaza and they crush any cell, any effort by ISIS to establish itself in, in Gaza. But eventually, you know, they are fighting each other, but we shouldn't forget that for all of them, we are still a major enemy. The regional order, which exists here since the end of the First World War, sykes picot Agreement, collapsed, no doubt about it. I mean, Iraq and Syria are not there. It will take years, if at all it's possible, to rebuild them, um, to assemble, you know, what broken down. Libya is not a state anymore. Yemen, uh, a civil war, so it's a major challenge to the regional uh, uh, order and it will take years till we'll be able to establish a new order. I think that what Israel should expect is a chaos. Gr armed groups, gangs, uh, terrorist organization, no states. We shouldn't speak about states, we should speak about uh, Somalia, and Libya, and now Syria, Iraq. That's what we are to face, you know, a chaos, complete chaos.